And hello, everybody. You're very welcome to a new On Location episode here on ITSB Magazine. I'm flying solo today. No Marco Cipelli joining me. Uh, as many folks know, when, when we're doing these conversations, Marco usually chats with me, with our guest, as we cover events. But he says, when it's technical, leave me out of it. You guys have fun. <laughs> so here we are. I'm thrilled to have Steve Wilson on. Steve, how are you? Doing great, Sean. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, good, good to have you on. And uh, and it's a topic near and dear to my heart. Broad, broad scope, looking at AppSec is something that I love love talking about. I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to do uh, some good things in the space. And, of course, there's no lack of interest in AI and LLMs. And you're presenting on this topic around the project that you've, that you've uh, been working on at, at OWASP. You're presenting an update of the LLM project uh, at a WASP in San Francisco uh, yeah. very soon. So I'm excited to have a chat with you and understand a little bit more about the project and what people can expect uh, with your session. Before we get into that, though, maybe a couple words on some of the things you work on, a WASP and otherwise, uh, to kind of set the stage. Yeah. So um, uh, I have a lot of things that I like working on, but I'd say all, all of them right now pivot around the crux of some combination of AI and cybersecurity. So uh, my day job is I'm the chief product officer at Exabeam, which is a leader in AI-driven security operations. The company's been using AI and machine learning in various formats for 10 years to detect anomalies and, and cybersecurity attacks. and. You know, that experience in the cybersecurity field using AI, you know, that kind of led me as the discovery of all of, you know, the explosion of these large language models led me into getting interested in that. And that led me to getting much more involved in OWASP last year and starting the OWASP Top 10 for Large Language Models project, which we'll talk about. Uh, that in turn led me to a point where O'Reilly approached me about writing a book about LLM and AI security, which I just finished up and should be out next month. That's called the Developer's Playbook for Large Language Model Security. I love it. And with, with any luck, I'll have, uh, have you back on to uh, dig deeper into the book and, and what people can expect there. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have a few conversations uh, around the OWASP top 10 for uh, and LLMs. When I was with uh, Jason Haddix, we went through we went through the top 10 things and, and discussed what the impact is to organizations if they don't address them and how the OWASP top 10 uh, helps with that. And I also had the, the pleasure of speaking with uh, Sandy Dunn, who does the uh, did the checklist, I believe, for, for this as well to kind of help yeah. organizations take the top 10 to the next level. And so I'll, I'll include links to those both both of those conversations because I think they're they're very important. Um, for the moment now, though, for people that haven't listened to those yet, kind of describe to me why I think we all know why, but I want to hear it from you. Why why, why we needed a top ten uh, for LLMs from OWASP? How how did that whole whole thing get started? Yeah, it's. It's interesting. I mean, you you have to rewind in the time machine a little bit and remember what the world was like in early 2023. Um, you know, ChatGPT had just come out. It went from zero to the world's most popular SaaS application in history in the matter of a few weeks. There was a ton of interest around this and, and people were just running off starting to develop things. But working in the cybersecurity industry, I started doing some research on what does it mean to secure these things? And, and people had written papers and there were little scattered things, but frankly, there was nothing that was well organized on the topic. And, you know, working in the security industry, I was familiar with OWASP. I worked with people who were really in the OWASP community. And, um, and I was working actually closely with Jeff Williams at the time, who wrote the first OWASP top 10 list. And uh, I floated the idea with him of what if we wrote a top 10 for large language models? And he actually encouraged me to pursue that and helped me get introduced to the right people at OWASP. Um, what was interesting is going back to when we started this in, let's call it spring last year, 
was I announced it on my LinkedIn page. I hoped I would find 10 or 15 like-minded people in the world who are interested in this and we could build a little working group and, and discover some fun stuff. Uh, you know, just a random post on my LinkedIn page got tens of thousands of views. I had 200 people on a Slack channel within the first few days, all volunteering to help. And it just grew from there. And um, one of the things that we decided early on was we had to do this quickly. Like there was, there was no guidance out there. The standards bodies, you know, the NISTs and the MITRES and all those, as important as they are, they take a year, two years to do anything. We kind of put together a roadmap and said, let's do something in six weeks. We got a lot of smart people here. Um, let's put something together quick. And and sort of the combination of the the interest and the timing, it, it really blew up. And I, I don't know how many people have read it, but I guarantee you it's in the hundreds of thousands at this point. <laughs> Yeah, and I think uh, it's an important point. I mean, I'm a huge fan of OWASP, and uh, to your point, there are tremendous numbers of incredibly smart people <laughs> doing, yeah. doing cool things and, and giving back through projects, small, big, large, all over the map, touching on different things. So I was thrilled to see this one come to bear. It, it interests me, or I don't know if I interest is the right word, but I, I find it strange well, I, I don't know, it's honestly, can leave it at interesting. I guess the point that this is, when ChatGPT came around with the interface where you could prompt through a UI, um, that's kind of what was new and took the world by storm. But people were already building AI and large language model stuff before that. I think, so we, we had the risk there. I think the, the, the prompt-based uh, exposure and then the wild success that the that the UI driven uh, chat GBT had kind of highlighted the fact that we really need to take take some action here now <laughs> yeah the the way that I I talk to people about it is obviously pe people have been developing stuff real useful stuff with AI for decades I started my first AI company in 1992 and you know, I sold software to Citibank and John Deere Tractor, and they were using it to do interesting things. But, um, you know, the interesting thing about these AI applications is they were very much what I would call back office stuff. And, you know, it was the kind of stuff where the security is could be very much traditional security where it's like, it's, hey, it's behind a firewall. People don't see it. People don't touch it. Um, and the security research was was actually a lot of it was very academic about data poisoning and it was more worried about Russian spies implanting data that might affect, you know, U.S. defense initiatives and things like that. The idea that these these chatbots come out and be front of front and center, um, there'd been places where this had happened. You know, Microsoft put out a chatbot in sort of 2016. It was like a, supposed to be a cute, fun teen entertainment thing and people immediately hacked it using things like prompt injection and data poisoning and turned it into some sexist Nazi. Um, it was a PR disaster at the time. So we've known those vulnerabilities were there, but with, with chat GPT, immediately every enterprise is thinking, how do I attach this to my enterprise data stores? How do I put this on my website? How do I give customers access to it? All that back office stuff went away. It's now front line for your business. And all of a sudden it went, it just shot to the top of every CISO's list in terms of like, oh crap, how am I gonna secure this? Yeah. And, the, and the growth of apps, and let's remember that if you're using an LM, it's usually driven by an a API that's used as part of some other app, which, so if you build a, an LLM driven service, you're probably putting it into a bunch of things in the organization, yeah. uh, further exposing it as well. Um, just for sake of clarity, I don't know, I can run down them or, or you can either way, the, the, the current top 10, just to kind of paint that picture for folks. Yeah. I, I don't think we need to read off the top 10, but I'll hit, I'll hit some of the ones that were, that were really key in, in the original top 10 and that do get a lot of interest. Um, the one at the top, uh, for folks that are OWASP, uh, the name will certainly sound familiar is it's called prompt injection. And 
there's been some kind of injection attack on almost every top 10 list for every technology going back to the very first top 10 list that had, you know, SQL injection at the top of the list. Um, but prompt injection really in this case is, is anything where the attacker is using what I call a, you know, crafty prompt to get the bot to do something that's out of alignment with your wishes. And that could be between jailbreaking it and turning off all its guardrails so you could use it for nefarious purposes or tricking it into giving you information that you shouldn't have. Um, some of the other ones, uh, one of the ones that I talk about more and more, and we'll, we'll come back to this when we talk about the next iteration of the list, is supply chain risk. Again, it's something OWASP people have become really familiar with. You look at things like Log4j, which was probably the biggest AppSec event of the last decade. It was a supply chain issue. Um, the AI software supply chain is a dumpster fire right now. Um, you know, it's this this ecosystem has developed so fast that things like Hugging Face has exploded to become the GitHub of AI stuff, but it's it's grown up so fast. There isn't a lot of infrastructure for knowing what you're getting is from a, a good place. And, um, you know, people have been doing studies. There's, there's thousands of tainted models and tainted tra training data sets and things that are out there. So where you're getting this stuff becomes very important and how do you track the the providence of what you're getting and what are you putting into your application the basic problem set is the same as it has been but whole new set of components um some of them very different than you know sort of here's the linux packages or the python packages that i'm putting into my app yeah, um and just quickly i think that i don't know i i don't know if i can count the number of times that this particular point came up in conversations that we had during Black Hat. And we mm -hmm. did, I don't know, 24 podcasts for Black Hat. <laughs> and I don't know, maybe 15%, 20% of them had had some some connection to supply chain and APIs and LLMs. And yeah, it's it's definitely on top of mind for a lot of folks. But I'll give you I'll give you two more, um, which are the the ones that have been I'll call them controversial in certain ways because they're not the ones that sound like all the ones from the other top 10 lists. Um, one of them is what we call excessive agency. And um, you could say with a little bit of stretch, it's kind of like least privilege, but really as, as people move from building, you know, chat bots to co-pilots to autonomous agents, the level of risk that you're taking on by providing responsibility for your LLM to take actions goes up and up and up. And when we talk about excessive agency, um, it can be as much of a product management issue as it is an AppSec issue. It's like, what are you designing your LLM to do? If your LLM is designed to execute a stock trade, then it's going to execute stock trades. And uh, if, for example, someone uses a prompt injection to trick your bot into doing something, it might execute a trade that you didn't want it to execute. And, you know, I take this all the way to the extreme, which is the example I use. Um, everybody's seen 2001, at least anybody who's a nerd. Um, you know, at the end of the movie, Hal turns off the life support systems for most of the crew. Um, why could Hal turn off the life support systems with no human in the loop? because they gave him the agency to do that. And he probably shouldn't have had it. Um, and, you know, it is funny to look at 2001 now and go and watch it in a world where you use chat GPT every day. Boy, Hal's not science fiction at all anymore. Right. It's like right in line. Um, last one I'll hit is what we call over-reliance. And this has to do with sort of the nature of hallucinations and people just believing stuff that LLMs tell them that, they shouldn't believe, and it gets you into a shocking amount of trouble if you don't manage this. So I want to, I like that last one as well, but I want to go back to the previous one and get your thoughts on this, because obviously OWASP is designed to bring security and risk management back to the world of DevOps and engineering and application development. Mm -hmm. And in the old, I used to be a QA engineer and 
building stuff, testing stuff when it wasn't actually called AppSec. <laughs> but in the old days, I do have gray hair. In the old days, we could fairly easily define the scenarios that we knew we wanted this thing to function within and therefore write test cases and user scenarios to validate that what it's supposed to do, it does. What it's not supposed to do, it doesn't. To me, when we when we throw in the LLM stuff, uh, it, it's almost endless scenarios that are possible. It seems so, to me. So I don't know your thoughts on that. Yeah. So this is this is one of the reasons that that I do. First off, when when we talk about who the audience is for the top ten list, and then some of the other works that we've created from the group, like our CISO checklist. There's been so much interest from parties that aren't classically people who came to OWASP for guidance, but we've been out there on the front lines providing guidance. So these other audiences come and want to listen and want to get advice. So we do put out a lot of guidance that's intended for, you know, CISOs or maybe even not really security people like product managers. And one of the first pieces of advice I do give people is you want to limit the scope of what you're doing with the LLM. The more that you can constrain the scope of what it does, the less worries you have about what it's going to take on from an agency perspective, right? If I really restrict its permissions, then it can do less wrong. I tell people, not joking at all, that you need to treat your LLM as something between a confused deputy and an enemy sleeper agent in the middle of your app. And if you take that very skeptical attitude with that component, um, you know, and kind of look where it sits in the trust boundaries, you you have to really scrutinize what goes on there. Um, and then you know you get to the point where you're thinking about from a product management perspective, you know, how do I give the LLM enough data so that it knows how to do its job effectively and doesn't just hallucinate all the time because it's making stuff up. But how do I balance that with really restricting the data that it has access to so that it can't give the wrong data to the wrong person because it gets confused? Yeah, or, or wrong data to uh, an authorized system. Absolutely. <laughs> <That should>, <laughs> yeah. um, so let's let's shift over to your session. Uh, so OWASP Global AppSec in San Francisco, September 23 through 27. You're speaking on Thursday, the 26th at 3.30. Uh, basically, give an update on the project. What can you share uh, with us here that will get people to join you in San yeah. Francisco for that session? So, you know, we put out the first version of the list last summer. We updated it last fall. Um, and, and at that point, we decided, look, we have some solid guidance out there. We're going to let it marinate a little bit. We're going to get a lot of feedback from people. We're also going to let this field mature a little bit and see where it goes. And so we focused the early part of this year on mostly just doing evangelism, you know, going out and telling that story and, and bringing, bringing the guidance to more and more people, which was great. But earlier this year, we started what we call the 2.0 project, which is what's the next major revision of the list going to be. And, you know, we're aiming for that to come out later this fall. And so at the session, we're going to we're going to talk about some of the things that we've learned since the first version of the list. What are the big topics that are cropping up um, and what's maybe some of the ways that the list is evolving? And we'll we'll give a sneak peek at that um, during the session. And how, how much? No specifics, because we want people to hear the whole session and maybe you can come back on and elaborate on some of the things that you presented and also heard from from the group when you when you had a chance to connect with them there but is the the feedback you're getting related to the top 10 specifically and or are you hearing things of well here is how we made some assumptions creating the top 10 based on how llms work that's changed completely how organizations are using them that's changed completely as well or significantly, I should say. Yeah. So there's, there's just the, here's the feedback and what you did. And then also things, things have moved dramatically yeah. since the last time we put this out. The good news is that the feedback on the first versions of the list has been just incredibly positive. People are really appreciative of the guidance and the fact that we managed to create a fairly tight 
document that people can understand and digest. We've really seen it get taken up by the industry and it's become kind of an underpinning to a lot of other standards bodies work. People like NIST and MITRE and things have taken it in and put it into their slower running standards bodies. And, and I think that's awesome. But what we have seen is the development patterns that people are using for LLMs have matured a lot. Um, you know, not surprisingly, given how many people are doing it, and how fast the space is moving. And, um, you know, just to tease a couple of the things that have kind of risen up the list, um, you know, we've talked about this idea of agency and wanting to limit that. But at the same time, people are putting a lot more autonomous agents into practice. And so what does that mean? How do you how do you approach that when you really do want to give it agency? What's the best way to do that? Um, uh, do you, does that lead to people need to start thinking about response as well? <laughs> right? uh, yeah. Looking for anomalies and then figuring out how to. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, monitoring your LLM and logging everything that it's doing and looking at it almost like you do users with things like user behavior analytics. That's you know, analyzing what's going on in your LLM is incredibly important. Um, same thing when you're looking at what's going on inside the app, one of the other just huge topics and shifts in terms of how people develop this is, um, you know, in classic AI security, a lot of your focus is on your training process and your training data. And what we're finding is most of the people using LLMs right now do no training. They take a pre-trained transformer and they're using patterns like retrieval augmented generation or what you call RAG to give it data and context. And it turns out a lot of security considerations with how you do that. And so I think that's another thing finding its way to sort of top of consciousness for the expert group right now. Nice one. Well, I'm excited to, uh, to hear more during this session and uh, continue to watch the progress of this uh, of this project. I appreciate you did putting it out there to start and getting so many people involved and getting getting something out quickly and continuing to invest in uh, in updating it. Everybody should uh, go to AppSec Global 2024, San Francisco, September 23-27. Catch Steve for the project project update for OWASP Top 10 for LLMs on Thursday the 26th at 3.30. And of course, I'll, I'll include links to uh, to the session, to your book, which touches on this as well um, as, as that's available. And a couple other chats that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, please do connect with Steve. See everybody at OWASP Apps at Global in San Francisco very, very soon. Thanks, Steve, for joining me. Thanks, Sean, for having me. And I look forward to every, seeing everybody in uh, San Francisco soon. Perfect. Thanks everybody for listening and watching. Please stay tuned. I, uh, I have some more, more things up my sleeve uh, for OWASP, AppSec Global in San Francisco and many more events that uh, Mark and I plan to uh, cover this year and into the beginning of next. So please stay tuned to On Location here on ITSB Magazine. Thanks everybody.